production for the past three months, consecutive three years. So imagine this patient, this is the patient that you approach to the bedside and you see cups full of sputum. And look, try to perceive the other of this sputum. If you don't smell anything, it's most of the time it's chronic bronchitis. If you smell a, a, a fetid odor or a posse kind of like odor, uh, most of the time this sputum is coming from a bronchiectasis. disease. Of course, this is the di diagnosis of a CAT scan, but uh, when you have no resources in certain countries, uh, you go by the quality of the sputum and your uh, auscultation to be able to diagnose the patient. We talked about hemoptysis already, so again, it's coughing up blood. Uh, and again, look for inflammatory conditions, infectious processes, and also ask for the quality. If it's only strikes of blood, it's hemoptoid sputum, inflammation or infection, uh, excluding tuberculosis. And the reason why I exclude tuberculosis in the infectious process is because tuberculosis tends to produce cavitary lesions that erode vessels and, uh, and pulmonary tissues, and therefore those patients have more frank hemoptysis. Frank hemoptysis can also be present in patients that have no lung problems, but for example, if you take Coumadin or Lovenox or Arixtra or any type of anticoagulant, or if you do have a diathesis of uh, 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 a blood, like uh, for example, patients that have factor A deficiency and they have hemophilia, sometimes they have hemoptysis without having any type of lung problem. So look for that as well. If you have a patient that is on anticoagulant and is having a hemoptysis, you have to stop the anticoagulant and do a chest x-ray immediately and see if the patient has a hemothorax, okay? And uh, in addition to that, never, never, never do a bronchoscopy on a patient that has a frank hemoptysis when the patient is on anticoagulant. If the hemoptysis is related to any pulmonary condition, of course, bronchoscopy is a diagnostic test to be able to know exactly what's going on inside. Uh, always, always uh, uh, ask the patient uh, if they smoke or they have smoked in the past. This is a major risk factor for pulmonary conditions, even though you know smoking is a risk factor for cardiovascular, for GI, for even bladder cancer. Uh, but uh, every time you encounter a patient that smokes, that is actively smoking, is the uh, Medicare regulations that you do counseling uh, to the patient, that you provide a patient a 1-800 number or uh, websites to be able to quit and also provide mediums of quitting as well, such as uh, nicotine patch or uh, any other, uh, uh, at least in the hospital we provide, or you start with the, the cheapest, uh, uh, the most economic way to be able to uh, uh, quit, but never, never uh, um, uh, uh, leave the patient unattended and, and no, no counseling the patient uh, for smoking sensation. So ask the patient about smoking in every single visit um, and advise the patient to stop. Uh, you have to also assess their readiness. You have to ask the patient, have you ever thought about quitting? And uh, do you need help? Um, I can provide you that. And also arrange uh, follow-ups uh, to be able to see the progression of these patients. These patients get a lot of anxiety uh, 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 quitting. And there's, there's many more uh, uh, mediums uh, uh, of, of, of quitting that we uh, um, taught you in pharmacology. So techniques for examination, uh, remember that uh, in any type of health assessment, you start with inspection. So look at, uh, always, always try to uncover the patient's chest uh, and try to look for uh, signs of distress. If the patient has any type of uh, um, intercostal uh, um, retraction that can indicate that the patient has that respiratory distress or sternocleidomastoid uh, retraction as well. You can also look at the um, uh, diaphragmatic breathing. If the patient has any type of diaphragmatic breathing or paradoxical breathing or abdominal breathing, this is also a sign of distress. Look for um, scar uh, from the outside in the skin. Sometimes when the patients do have a scar in the back, that can uh, indicate that the patient had a lung surgery. And ask the patient, many patients forget to give you that detail. So inspection is very important. In addition, the thoracic cage 
the form. Many patients have scoliosis or lordosis or kyphosis, or sometimes they have pectus cavatum or carinatum. We're going to go through that in a second. That that will, even though there are congenital conditions, that could impair tidal volume and, and therefore uh, respiratory function. Okay? In addition to that, progress to palpation. When you palpate, uh, you have to palpate the outside of the lung. You cannot palpate the inside. We're going to go through the steps of palpation and what can you find in palpation as well. Uh, precaution, uh, when you precaution, never, never precaution above the rib because what you're looking for is a resonant sound of the air inside the lung. So if you put your fingers on top of any bone, scapula, or sternum, or rib, you would never uh, produce that sound. And then, of course, after that, auscultation. So the order of uh, pulmonary assessment is inspection, palpation, precaution, and auscultation. So what can you see in inspection? As I said, the rate and rhythm, the depth, is the patient comfortable breathing? Is the patient in any type of distress? Look for ask accessory muscles that the patients are pulling to be able to breathe properly. As I previously stated, look for the shape of the chest. If the patient has any scoliosis, lordosis, any kyphosis, any um, uh, type of uh, uh, um, uh, a barrel chest that indicates that the patient most likely has COPD, uh, they have a very, very long AP diameter. Um, look for pectus carinatum or scavatum. Um, and in addition to that, look for the hands of the patient. If the patient has any type of clubbing, um, um, the, the, the distal portion of the, of the fingers are engorged, and that is a sign of chronic hypoxia. Look for the palms of the hands to see if they're having palm erythema. Even though this could be present in liver conditions, highly present in pulmonary conditions where the patients are having chronic hypoxemia as well. Look for the staining of the cigarette. Many patients deny that they do smoke because they don't want uh, people to start uh, counseling them, them about smoking cessation. So to, in order to avoid that uh, event, they denied uh, smoking and you are able to see it. Never confront the patient, of course. If you believe that the patient is smoking, even if you can smell the nicotine on the patient's clothes, uh, never confront the patient. Just uh, uh, have it in the back of your mind as a risk factor, but never tell the patient, oh really, you don't smoke, or what about those fingers, or what about the smell? Okay, that's not appropriate. Ask always the patient, how, do you use oxygen at home? Because that gives you an indication of chronic pulmonary conditions. And in addition, how much do you uh, uh, use at home? Two liters, three liters, how much do you use? Because if you now do an ABG on room air, of course you're expecting to see hypoxemia, but this patient is oxygen dependent. Uh, so again, pectus cavatum is no more than a funnel chest. Scavatum is to the inside. And if you have any uh, um, deep inside uh, uh, indentation of the sternum, uh, the tidal volume will be compromised. Uh, so basically it's just no more than a congenital condition that the patient has a hollow out uh, chest. Barrel chest is, is no more than uh, patients have a very, very long AP diameter and uh, this is most likely produced by hyper expansion. Patients that have uh, 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 a lot of uh, air being accumulated as residual volume and inspiration that is trapped and that produces flattening of the sorry, flattening of the diaphragm. You will be able to see this not only physically, but you will also see this in a chest x-ray. Normally when the patients are at rest, as I already explained you, you can count up to the nine to 10 rib, no more than that. If you're able to count up to the 12 rib, which are the floating ribs, this patient has a very high AP diameter. And most commonly is present in patients that have chronic pulmonary conditions, even though if you are the type of asthmatic patient that always are in severe exacerbation and status asthmaticus, of course, you will produce a hyperinflation and residual accumulation of volume, and you can also have a barrel chest. Scoliosis, again, is no more than a deviation laterally to the spine, and even though this is only musculoskeletal, uh, believe it or not, it does affect the tidal volume of one lung because if you're curved to the right, you have more expansion and more tidal volume on the left than on the right. That is uh, highly present in patients, for example, that have cerebral palsy, that they're 
constantly uh, laying in bed like this, um, uh, they, they do have a very compromised uh, tidal volume. Uh, kyphosis and uh, uh, lordosis, uh, uh, you have to think about this, uh, for example, in patients that have a very pronounced uh, 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 kyphosis, uh, in patients that have a, a, like um, a term pregnancy, um, even though pregnancy uh, if, um, um, push up on the diaphragm, compromising tidal volume, in addition to that, the position of the uh, a spine can also compromise uh, tidal volume. Uh, pectus carinatum is the contrary of the pectus caratum. It's also congenital condition, so the sternum goes to the outside like a pigeon. And uh, you might believe, well, that expands the tidal volume. No, because the ribs that are uh, located in the sternocostal angle are basically squished. And uh, that's the reason why they do have compromised tidal volume as well. So these are the examples. This is the pectus cabatum. You don't see it as much here, but that's the carinatum, like a little triangle pointing out. And those are the uh, examples of the uh, x-ray. We're going to have a radiology class. Um, you have a patient with scoliosis and kyphosis. Um, and again, um, the pregnant women that also gets affected. Remember inspection, look at the scar tissue. This patient most likely had a lobectomy. So ask the patient, what happened here? Many patients forget to give you that pertinent information, okay? And uh, look for accessory muscles of respiration to see if the patient is uh, in any type of distress. Uh, cyanosis, cyanosis, there's two types, peripheral cyanosis and central cyanosis. Peripheral cyanosis, any of us can have peripheral cyanosis if you're exposed to any cold weather environment. Uh, but that is not uh, uh, due to chronic uh, hypoxemia. But for example, if you do live uh, in uh, countries that are high altitude, such as Peru, uh, pe pe uh, people that live there uh, tend to have central cyanosis, even though it's not a disease process, but they're going through chronic hypoxemia all the time. Of course, they do not develop uh, clubbing at, at, uh, up to that stage because the body gets used to that. Uh, but patients that do have chronic pulmonary conditions in and they live in chronic hypoxemia, they have central cyanosis, lips, they have the nail beds, uh, uh, cyanotics, as you can see. But in addition to that, the distal portion of the fingers engorged, and that is called clubbing, okay? And in addition to that, there is a test that you can do uh, to be able to uh, determine if the patients do have clubbing. As you can see, the nail plate is all flat and concave, and the distal portion of the fingertip is also engorged. It's called the Schermer sign, which is basically when you have normal uh, nail plates and no normal distal phalange, when you approximate the distal uh, uh, fingers, you have like a tiny little triangle space between the nail beds, as you can see here. But when the patients have clobbing, that angle is never present. Okay, so what can cause clobbing and cyanosis? I am not pretending you to memorize this list, but if you think about pulmonary conditions and heart conditions and any disease process that can give you chronic hypoxemia, you have them all. So bronchiectasis is no more than, if you remember patho, permanent dilation of the bronchioles with accumulation of purulent sputum. So this patient, of course, the gas exchange is gonna be compromised and that's permanent, that's irreversible. So the patient will be in chronic hypoxemia. Patients with cystic fibrosis as well, remember that they do have a lack congenitally of the chlorine channel, so the mucus become very uh, viscose and not only at the level of the lung, but all the exocrine glands are affected. So having viscous mucus production will impair gas exchange. Patients with any abscess that, of course, if it's a temporary condition, would never provoke it, but if the patient is immunocompromised or have cancer and have uh, apyemas all the time, they do have uh, chronic hypoxia. So pulmonary fibrosis, patients with pneumoconiosis, such as asbestosis, um, patients that have uh, uh, any pulmonary condition, that patients that work in mines, 
uh, patients that work in fiberglass or wood, uh, anything that affects the lung chronically that produces pulmonary fibrosis can produce chronic hypoxia. Um, as, as I said, not only pulmonary conditions can do that, but in addition to that, patients that have any chronic hypoxemia due to, for example, cyanotic heart diseases or endocarditis or patients that have uh, cardiomyopathies, advanced cardiomyopathies can have um, clubbing and central cyanosis. Central, remember, peripheral is from all of us. Now, what about Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis? Patients that have Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, remember this is also an autoimmune condition, a hypersensitivity reaction type 3, that not only autoimmune complexes are deposited at the level of the uh, intestine, but it can be present in any uh, uh, tissue as well. Remember that these patients not only have intestinal problems, but later on they tend to have pericarditis, uh, they tend to have uh, pleuritis and pleurofusions, and therefore they tend to have chronic hypoxemia and having uh, cyanosis and uh, uh, clogging. Cirrhosis of the liver, uh, remember that when the patients have cirrhosis of the liver um, and they do develop portal hypertension, uh, when the um, pressure at the level of the portal system is very high, that produces a regurgitant amount of uh, volume, not only to the areas that have less pressure, such as the esophagus producing esophageal viruses, but in addition to that, they have a very high venous return producing right side of heart failure, and therefore they tend to have uh, um, what's called hepatopulmonary uh, 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 syndrome, which is uh, no more major vasodilatory uh, substances being released. Uh, uh, prostaglandin, we're gonna study all that in GI. Prostaglandin releasing and vasodilation, and therefore gas exchange is impeded. So you can have, due to liver cirrhosis, hepatopulmonary syndrome, or hepatorenal syndrome. As you can see here, you can see the staining of the cigarette and the pulmonary erythema that the patients can have. What about palpation? On palpation, basically, you will look, put your the palm of your hands in the patient's chest anteriorly and posteriorly, and first you can determine the chest excursion. Okay, so basically, you will put your hands below the scapula and you approximate your thumbs and you ask the patient to take a deep breath and normally the thumbs should separate against midline. So from midline that you start when the patients take a deep breath, the expansion has to be symmetric. If one lung expands and the other one stays in place, you do have a pulmonary condition in this lung. Most likely is pleurofusion or the patient has a pneumothorax, and that's the reason why it hasn't expanded, etc. Okay, in addition to that, what else can you palpate? Well, you can put your hands on the patient's chest, posteriorly or anteriorly, and ask the patient to talk. Most of the time, you ask the patient to say, ah, or 99, or 66, so any number, any letter that can provoke a high vibration at the level of the chest. And what happens? When the patients have increased air in the lungs, such as in hyperinflation, COPD, asthma, or when the patients have a pneumothorax, for example, the vibrations of the voice decrease. When the patients have an increased consolidation, so any um, heart tissue, as I can say, for example, a mass, consolidation is also a pneumonia. So any solid tissue, which is pneumonia or mass, will increase the vibration of the voice. When the patients have water, in this case fluid, the vibrations of the voice are abolished or decreased. So from decreased to completely abolished. And we used to say in medicine that vibrations of the voice or the transmission of the voice either by palpation or auscultation, walk very well. So when you walk, you walk in a solid environment. When you walk in the lung in a solid environment, you walk over tumors or you walk over cobblestones, which is pneumonia. And therefore, the voices increase. The voices can fly. So if they fly, 
they fly, but not very well. You can fly for a limited time, so you fly in air. So the voices tend to decrease. And the voices tend to drown in a water environment. So therefore, whenever the patients have pleural effusions or hemothorax or empyemas, the voices are from diminished to abolished or not present. Okay? So that's kind of like a mnemonic to be able to remember. So this is the chest excursion. So basically, you locate the uh, um, uh, lower border of the scapula and you put your fingers in the middle and you allow the patient to take a deep inspiration and that's the way you measure chest expansion. And again, it has to be symmetric expansion. Now, when do you see asymmetry? When the patient doesn't, when the lung doesn't move properly, and basically you're looking for a disease process located in that particular lung that has no expansion or decreased expansion. The lung does not expand in pulmonary fibrosis because it's full of scarring. Fluid, when the lung is full of fluid, will not expand properly. If you have an entire lobe infected with pneumonia, it will not expand. Sometimes the patients have no major disease process, but pain limits expansion. If you now have a patient with cabbage and you tell the patient to take a deep breath, the patient's not going to take a deep breath because they have pain. So exactly the same way when the patient has pleuritic pain, they tend to avoid deep, deep inspiration because the characteristic of pleuritic pain is sharp, stabbing, worsening inspiration. So that will limit excursion, and not necessarily the patient must have something inside the lung. So if you have any type of obstruction in that particular side by a mucus block, by a foreign body, that can produce also uh, asymmetric uh, expansion. Obviously, when the lung is collapsed by an atelectasis or a pneumothorax, that particular lung will not expand. This is basically examples of it. So when you palpate voice vibrations, it's called fremitus, okay? So basically you put your, the palms of your hands on the patient's anterior or posterior chest, and you can ask the patient, for example, to say, say 99. And again, it has to be felt symmetric. If you feel the voice higher in one area than in the other, that means that, remember, the voice increase when you walk, and you walk in a solid environment, so tumors or pneumonias. The voice decrease when you are in the presence of air, so air means hyperinflation, means pneumothorax, means asthma, and the voice is drowned in a fluid environment, so from super diminished to abolish in fluid, pleural effusions, okay? So basically try to compare and avoid touching the bones, avoid touching the spine because you never ever will feel the voice in bone environment. Now, in addition to that, well this is basically the explanation of what I just told you about, again, if you remember the mnemonic that I explained to you, that the voices walk very well in a solid environment, tumors, consolidation pneumonia, the voices diminished because they fly, but not very well, and they drown in a fluid environment, you don't have to memorize any disease process. Precaution. When you're performing precaution, remember, never ever put your fingers on top of the ribs, because otherwise you will feel Dullness, you will hear dullness. You will never, never hear resonance. You have to put your fingers horizontally, one finger horizontally with the palm up. Never, never, never put the palm touching the patient. So you put the middle finger in the intercostal space and you percuss with these two fingers, okay? So this is basically the explanation of how do you percuss and again, flatness, dullness is in the presence of fluid. Flatness, dullness is in the presence of a solid environment. So that means that if you 
when you percuss, you hear flatness or dullness what's below that area or inside the lung could be anything solid which is tumors or consolidation or it could be also fluid which is pleural effusion and pyema or hemothorax now when you percuss and you hear resonance it's normal but when you hear increase of resonance or hyper resonance that means there is trap of air asthma emphysema patients with COPD, even in pneumothoraxis, okay? Timpani is for the belly. Timpani is for the GI, for the abdominal examination. As you can see, the finger is horizontal in the intercost, intercostal space. Never do what I have seen Your intercostal space is not perpendicular, it's not vertical. You have to put your finger horizontal, okay? As you can see, the palm of the examiner never touch the patient's back or chest. So you put your finger like this, the palm off, and you strike with one or two fingers. I like to strike with two, okay? And you go in a ladder pattern. We're gonna teach you that in a second. This is what's called ladder pattern. So you don't percuss as you wish in any order. You have to percuss right, next, down, next, down, next, down, next, down, next, and you go up, down, up, and down. That is called ladder pattern distribution for auscultation and precaution. Again, when you precaus, flatness or dullness is basically solid. So when you precaus the intercostal space, normally should be resonance. Try to precaus above a rib, which is solid, so you could hear the difference, which is dullness or flatness. When you also percuss on top of any organ, in this case, liver uh, uh, or anything solid, such as an illness of tumors or consolidations or fluid, which is also flatness, will be uh, not resonant. Okay, hyper resonance is very loud compared to the normal uh, uh, percussion, and uh, hyper resonance means trap of air inside the lung. Timpani is mostly for uh, abdominal examination. And remember, resonance is what you want to hear, that's the normal lung. Hyperresonance is hyperinflated lung, again, most of the time present in patients that have emphysema or any uh, 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 hyperinflation such as asthma or even pneumothoraxis, okay? Remember, dullness is occupied by a, I'm sorry, by a fluid or by solid, which is tumors or uh, consolidation pneumonia. Okay? So, auscultating the posterior part of the lung uh, is exactly the same technique, okay? Uh, of course, in the anterior portion of the lung, you only have access to the uh, uh, first and second intercostal space because the rest is occupied by the, the mediastinum, the heart. So you ha actually have to do exactly the same pattern, okay? So tell the patient to take a deep breath and uh, you will be auscultated uh, looking for symmetry and, and you would auscultate in the same ladder pattern as precaution, okay? What are the normal auscultation sounds? So vesicular is basically low pitch and it's usually heard in most of the lungs. So what you're trying to look for, again, for precaution is resonance, for auscultation is vesicular. There are other normal breath sounds present, which for example is bronchial, is mostly higher pitch than vesicular, and it's heard over the manubrium of the sternum. So basically, if you hear at this level, in the second intercostal space, close to the manubrium of the sternum, 
will be mostly bronchial. Bronchial vesicular is also normal, is also a, a medium a type of pitch intensity that is heard over the first and second intercostal space, but not close to the maneuver of the sternum, it's mostly outside and also posteriorly. Tracheal, very, very close to the trachea, if you ask to take at the level of the apex or in the neck, because you can listen to the neck to see if the patient has any kind of strider, for example. So if you listen to close to the tracheal area or above the clavicles, which the apex is located, of the apex of the lung, you will hear mostly tracheal. So again, as I said, auscultation. So we talked about uh, uh, precaution. How can you hear in the presence of disease process? We talked about also palpation, in this case, the diaphragmatus, how the voices are transmitted depending on the disease process. Now let's talk about 